Hi guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to the Golang Design Pattern Tutorial Series. Today we're going to be talking about two patterns, the factory pattern and then the abstract factory pattern. The factory pattern is probably one of the most widely used creational patterns in object-oriented programming. In fact, you'll find that some programming languages, for instance Dart, have the factory pattern built directly into them. In Dart's case, it's built in in the form of factory constructors. The basic idea behind the factory pattern is to make it so that we can create an object without exposing the creation logic of that object to the client. And we refer to that object using a common interface. I've created a nice little diagram here which kind of shows off this pattern. So in our application, we're going to make a database interface and this interface will be implemented by two types of structs. We'll have a MongoDB struct and an SQLite struct. The database interface will have two functions attached to it, one of them to get data and then the other one to put data inside of it. And then we'll have a database factory, which will just be a function that takes in a string and then returns a database type. So either MongoDB or SQLite. This then of course creates our database type, which also has the database interface directly attached to it. And this database type can be accessed by the client through the database factory. And so ultimately the client doesn't really care or know whether or not it gets a MongoDB struct or a SQLite struct. All the client knows is that it's getting a database and it can access the get data function and the put data function that's attached to the database interface. All right, so for this example, I've created a separate package. And of course, we're going to be using our main.go file as well. Let's go ahead and define our two struct types. So we'll create our MongoDB struct, which will just have a database field inside of it, which is just a map of strings. And then we'll have an SQLite struct, which will also be a map of strings. Now let's create our database interface. So the database interface implements two functions, get data, which takes in a string and then outputs a string, and then put data, which takes in two strings and then outputs nothing. Our get data methods are pretty basic. We just pass in the query, and the query is just the key inside of the map of the database field of our database type. So in MongoDB's case, we just go mdb.database, pass in the query, and if we don't get back a result, then we just want to return an empty string. If we get back a result, however, we'll go ahead and print out the database type. So in this case, it will be MongoDB, and then we'll return the value from the map. For put data, we'll take in the query string and then the data string, and then we'll just grab the database, put in the query as the key, and then the data as the value. And we'll do this for both MongoDB and for SQLite. Now keep in mind, of course, if we were actually using MongoDB and SQLite, really wouldn't matter if our logic was different in these functions. So long as we could put in a query in the case of get data and then get back some data. And so long as we could put in a query and a data string in the case of put data and put data into the database. Now that we've gone ahead and implemented the two methods for our database interface on both of our structs, we can go ahead and create the actual factory constructor. And I'm just going to call this function database factory. It will take in an environment string and we'll use this environment string to decide which of these objects will pass back to the client. Because both of our objects implement the database interface, we can just use the database type as our return type. The idea here is that we're kind of simulating what would happen if we wanted to use two separate types of databases based on the environment that this app was being built in. So if we're building the app in production, we'll use MongoDB. And then if we're building the app in development, we'll use SQLite. So we switch on the string. If we get the production string, we'll create a new MongoDB struct. And of course we need to create the database map. With the development string, we can go ahead and create an SQLite object as well. And again, we want to make the map for our SQLite object. And if we get neither of these strings, then we can just return nil. Let's go back into our main module and we'll go ahead and import our factory module. And then we can define our two environments, so production and development. 
and we can go ahead and call factory database factory on these two environments to get our two different databases. So because this one is calling the production string, this should send us back a MongoDB instance. And because this one is calling development, this one should get back a SQLite instance. Now we can go ahead and use these databases. So I'm just going to put a test key into our databases and then I'll put in a little string that just says this is MongoDB or this is SQLite. And then we'll go and get the data back by passing the test key into get data and we'll just print it out with println. We can also go ahead and use the reflect library to see what the types are for our databases and what interfaces they implement. We'll go ahead and call reflect type of on db1 and we want to get the name of the type so we'll just get mongodb back and then we can call reflect type of on the reference to db1 and we can call dot element to get back the interface that it implements. And of course we can do the same for db2 and the reference to db2. We get back MongoDB when we call to put the data inside of our first database. And then we get back this is MongoDB, which is the value that we put in there. Then we get back SQLite when we call our SQLite database to put the data in. And then we get back this is SQLite when we get the data back. Then of course we get back our MongoDB type. Then we have the interface that the MongoDB type is implementing, which is our database interface. Then of course we get our SQLite type back and then the database interface again because SQLite is implementing it as well. So I'm sure you guys can see how this is a very nice pattern. We can dynamically change the type that we're getting back from our constructor based on the environment in this case. But we could do it of course based on any kind of condition that we wanted to. And because the client really doesn't care what object it's getting back or how the object is being created, we can just send back a general interface. And so in a way, this is a bit like dependency injection in the sense that we're just saying, all right, let's get a database and it can either be production or development. And then we can call these different interface methods on that database type. And we don't really care what the database is connected to or what the logic of the database is. All right, so now let's get into the abstract factory pattern. This again is another creational pattern. And the idea here is that we actually take the factory itself and we further abstract it back into what's called an abstract factory. It's essentially just a factory that produces other factories. On this side, on the right side here, we have our MongoDB and SQLite, and we have our database interface, and then of course the database factory. This we've already implemented. On the left side here, we've got another factory pattern where we have a file system interface instead of a database interface, and then we have two types, ext4 and ntfs, implementing this file system interface. And then these two types can be created by a file system factory. Now, because we want to be able to serve these two factories back to the client, we can use an abstract factory. And what this will do is it will pass back a factory type, which in this case will just be a function that takes in a string and returns an interface. The client can then call that abstract factory function and get one of our objects or a bunch of our objects. The idea here is that the abstract factory gives us a way of providing an interface for families of related or dependent objects without specifying their concrete classes. In other words, our client doesn't know the creational logic for all of our different objects. And because all of our different objects are conditional upon the same things, in this case, they're conditional upon the environment variable, we can sort of use them and leverage them together into one single function. And actually, if we were using a traditional object-oriented language, then the abstract factory would be an object rather than just a function. Let's go ahead and implement the structs and interfaces that we're going to need for this particular pattern. So first I'm going to create a file struct 
And I'm just going to create this for the sake of creating a file inside of our file system. So the file will have a name string and then a content string inside of it. Both of our file systems, NTFS and ext4, will have a single field, which will just be a map with the key being a string and then the value being a file type. Like with our database, we can go ahead and create a file system interface that we want both of these structs to implement. And file system will have two functions inside of it. One will be create file, which will just take in the file path that we want to create. And then the other one will be find file, which will go and take in the file path and then return the file. The create file methods are just going to take in the path string. We'll go ahead and we'll create a new file struct with content and the content will just be based on the file system that we're creating this in. So for this one, we'll create NTFS file. And then for this one, we'll create ext4 file. And then we'll give the file a name, which will just be the path that we're passing in here. Then we'll go ahead and put it inside of the map. So we just say NTFS.files path, which is the key. And then that equals the file that we just created. And then we'll also go ahead and just print out the file system type. So we'll print out NTFS or ext4, depending on which create file method we call. The find file functions will be very similar to our get data functions from our database structs. Because we are still dealing with maps, we want to check to see if the file exists inside of the map. And if it doesn't, then we'll just return an empty file. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and get that file and return it from the function. And of course, we'll do this for both of our file systems. We want to finish off the factory pattern for the file system. So let's go ahead and create a file system factory function, which takes in an environment string and then returns a file system type. And like with our database factory, we'll differentiate between the different file systems based on production and development. So for production environment, we'll return an NTFS file system. And of course we need to make the map here. And then for development environment, we'll return the ext4 file system. And again, we'll make a map. And if we get any other string, then we'll just return nil. Now we can go ahead and create the actual abstract factory function. And this is just a function that takes in a string and then returns a function that takes in a string and returns an interface. In other words, it returns one of our factory functions based on the string that we're passing in here. So we switch on the fact string. If we have a database string, then we'll pass back the database factory. And if we're looking for the file system, then we'll pass back the file system factory. Of course, we can go ahead and simplify the function by aliasing the function type to factory. That way we just return this alias instead of this entire function definition. Now notice if we come down to our abstract factory function, we're actually getting errors here when we return these two functions. And this is because each of these functions returns a different interface. And so what we need to do is generalize the interfaces that are being returned from these two functions. So to make this simple, we'll just go to both our file system factory and our database factory and change the return type into just a basic generalized interface. Now we can go back into our main module and let's create a helper function so that we can access our abstract factory properly. So I'm going to call this helper function setup constructors and it will take in the environment string. And then it will return a tuple of our database interface and our file system interface. So we'll go ahead and we'll get the file system factory and the database factory by calling abstract factory on file system and database. And then we'll just return calling these two factories on our environment string. And of course, we can go ahead and coerce the return type, that generic interface type that we put into our factories, into the appropriate interface type. So in the case of our database factory, we're going to return a database type. And then in the case of our file system factory, we're going to return a file system type. Now we can go ahead and call our setup constructors function, 
with our two environment variables. And this will give us our databases and our file systems. And of course, we can leave the database logic here and go ahead and create some logic to call on our file system. We'll go ahead and we'll call on file system one and we'll create a file and we'll put that file in file path example test ntfs.txt and then we'll print out the content of that file and we'll do the same with file system two except this time we'll call the file test etx4.txt. Let's also go ahead and reflect the type and the interface of our file system variables. So we can go ahead and just replicate the reflection calls that we had for our databases so that we can see the type and the interface of our file systems as well. If we go and run our application, you can see that we still get the database information like we did before. And now we also get the file system information. And of course, we get the file system reflections as well at the bottom here. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you just like this video, then by all means, download it as much as you like. If you want to catch the next Golang Design Pattern Tutorial video, then go ahead and hit that notification bell. Have a good night.